thank you all for being here uh, again this evening. Uh, and thank Dr. Jennings for um, an introduction to keep me humble. <laughs> Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Amos 9, 24. If justice was to roll down upon the poor, dispossessed, and excluded of ancient Israel, what should royalty and privileged elites do in order to let or allow justice to move through the community? The prophet sets his denunciation within a moral frame dependent upon moral teaching in Torah upon concrete fidelity to the Sinai covenant. Amos weighed these privileged elites on scales calibrated to the justice and judgment of the covenant and they were found waiting. They were found wanting. Amos called for fidelity in word and deed. We read in the book of Leviticus, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, and you shall not lie to one another. You shall not defraud your neighbor, you shall not steal, and you shall not keep for yourself the wages of a laborer until morning. You shall not revile the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. You shall fear your God, I am the Lord. You shall not render and unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice, you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. When an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as the citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you are aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. You shall not cheat in measuring length, weight, or quantity. You shall have honest balances, honest weights. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall keep all my statutes and all my ordinances and observe them. I am the Lord. Right responses to these covenantal demands, define the ancient Israelites as individuals and as a people. Or we could say, right response to suffering define the ancient Israelites as individuals and as a people. Put in current theological terms, social justice is interwoven with right religion. Or we might say that Amos called for the witness of solidaristic compassion. We might ask ourselves if our complicity with and reproduction of social suffering is complicit in failing to establish ourselves as a people. A people who love the Lord God. The phrase solidaristic compassion brings together two concepts, solidarity and compassion, that I'm trying to advance in these lectures. What is solidarity? 
What is compassion? How might solidaristic compassion motivate us in our time to respond to children, women, and men who are despised, dispossessed, and excluded? Moreover, what habits or practices might sustain and direct solidaristic compassion? These are questions that this second lecture will attempt to explore. First, defining solidarity and compassion. Solidarity is a rich and complex concept. The Oxford English Dictionary traces the origin of the word to the French <coughs> solidarité and defines solidarity as, quote, the fact or quality on the part of communities of being perfectly united or at one in some respect, especially in interests, sympathies, or aspirations, specifically with reference to the aspirations or actions of trade union members, close quote. So it is that solidarity has roots in the concerns and protests of European labor union movements of the mid 19th century, only recently entering into Christian religious and theological vocabulary. Although not unique to Catholic thought, solidarity appeared 80 years ago in the teaching of Pope Pius XII and gained traction in Roman Catholic social discourse in the aftermath of the Second Vatican Council. Nearly 20 years ago, Edmund Arnes suspected that despite advocacy for solidarity on personal, interpersonal, societal, and global levels, it had become a toothless appeal, a moralism. More recently, Maureen O'Connell echoed his assessment, declaring that despite examples of innovative witness, solidarity runs the risk of becoming little more than a trope. Yet, Ada Maria Isasi Diaz and John Sabrino maintain that solidarity, quote, brings out the way in which faith is made real, close quote, through mutual sharing of gifts and talents, through respect for rather than erasure of human difference. The moral philosopher Marciano Vidal insists that solidarity is a form of general justice. It is a virtue that compensates and completes or enhances justice. Justice orders solidarity and solidarity enhances justice. If solidarity is not guided by the principles of justice, it can easily become charity or mercy in the form of almsgiving, writing a check. With its perspectives of compassion, empathy, and sharing, solidarity has the power to see the suffering child, the suffering woman, the suffering man. With Johann Baptist Metz, I want to contend that political theology must hold on to solidarity in its indissoluble mystical universal and political particular dual structure with the goal of protecting universalism from apathy and partial solidarity from forgetfulness and hatred. More importantly, political theology must hold on to the dangerous memory of the life and ministry, death and resurrection of the crucified Jewish Jesus of Nazareth. For we learn from his example that love of neighbor can never be abstract, but rather must be concretized through the witness of practical action, the witness of solidaristic compassion. Philosopher Nancy Snow locates compassion along with pity, sympathy, and grief in the larger terrain of other regarding emotions. She affirms compassion as suffering with, as does Wendy Farley. Farley considers compassion as, quote, a mode of relationship and a power that is wounded by the suffering of others and that is propelled to action on their behalf, close quote. Both of these thinkers, along with Martha Nussbaum, distinguish compassion from pity. Snow maintains we can pity someone 
quote, while maintaining a safe emotional distance from what he or she is undergoing. <clears throat> we desire to relieve the other's plight, but we still feel this emotional distance. Farley insists that compassion is not, quote, an accidental response to a particular event of suffering or a passing feeling of pity. Compassion is a persisting way of interpreting and responding to the world. And finally, Nussbaum observes that compassion, unlike pity, with its, quote, nuances of condescension toward and superiority over the sufferer, quote, respects the person who is suffering. Compassion, Wendy Farley insists, requires one's whole self, quote, an acting, feeling, understanding, interpreting, valuing, embodied, close quote, other directed human being committed to become the servant of compassion's care for the world. Compassion denotes empathetic consciousness of others. It entails informed, critical awareness and understanding of the situation of oppression in which they are trapped. Compassion is a mode of relationship and a power. Critically conscious of and challenged by the suffering of others and that acts with them to resist that suffering Compassion acts to liberate and to heal the human spirit, to repair breakdowns in the natural, religious, cultural, social, and interpersonal realms. Thus, compassion comprises not only an affective dimension, but a cognitive and moral one as well. So we may speak then about a structure of compassion. Compassion originates in a deeply felt response, however inchoate, to an awareness of the seriousness of social suffering or social oppression or structural injustice. We may be and often are moved by the plight of families displaced by wildfires, hurricanes, and earthquakes, by the condition of women and men crowded in makeshift refugee camps or by the photograph of three-year-old Alan Kurdi, the little Syrian boy whose body washed up on a Turkish beach four years ago. Our first response, though, should be that of horror, of indignation at injustice, injustices and pain inflicted on God's human creatures. Here we are struggling against the cultural and social context within which we live. That context has become so serialized, so nimble, so fast moving, always being edited, always being curated. We have become toughened, habituated to the horror of social suffering. Initially, we are stunned. The media reports, the statistics, the appeals, but then advertising commercials or pop-ups distract us. Something else catches our attention. We move on. In confrontation with painful dehumanizing realities, with the social suffering of children, women, and men, awareness of social suffering ought to stir us to a prophetic anger. As a prelude to solidar solidaristic compassion, Prophetic anger awakens people from the anesthetization of the manipulative techniques of global neoliberal capitalism, calls our attention to the suffering of God's human creatures in everyday life. This anger is fueled by recognition of the violations of human dignity, of assault on humanness or personhood. Prophetic anger reorients us and turns us not toward hatred or revenge, 
but to commitment to the yearning of Jesus' brothers and sisters for life. Prophetic anger tills the soil of the heart, preparing it for active solidaristic action. Yet the effectiveness of that work requires knowledge. So I want to suggest then that compassion involves a cognitive element. That cognitive element is composed of two parts, understanding and recognition. The first cognitive element is critical understanding, ideology critique. In order to transform the social situation of oppression and to relieve the suffering it causes, we must critically understand the social order or structures within which the oppressed and we live. This requires that theology as political interrogate the social order or structures and contest the claim that economic exploitation, marginalization, powerlessness, cultural imperialism, and systemic violence are unfortunate, perhaps amoral, even iniquitous, yet nonetheless beyond our control. We push against thinking that these are natural, permanent, logically necessary, where ideology nat naturalizes, historicizes, and absolutizes. Katie Geneva Cannon describes this process of critical understanding as, quote, debunking, unmasking, and disentangling the ideologies, theologies, and systems of value operative in a particular society, and analyzing the established power relationships that determine cultural, political, and economic presuppositions, and evaluating the legitimizing myths that sanction the enforcement of such values." Close quote. The second cognitive element of compassion is rec recognition. Recognition that the flourishing and well-being of those suffering or oppressed are related intrinsically to our own flourishing and well-being. We recognize the suffering of another as a significant part of our own life's being. This recognition makes us vulnerable in the person of the other and functions as an indispensable epistemological requirement for compassion. In order to bear witness effectively in solidaristic compassion, the cognitive is linked to our moral transformation or conversion. We are called to a metanoia, quite literally a change of mind and heart and life, a change whereby the revelation of God's identification with the victims of oppression and suffering begins to heal the irrationalities of the manifold biases which harden our hearts and blunt our human reason. Moral transformation upends the criteria then by which we take our bearings and appraise various options for choice and decision. When what is truly good and what is mere satisfaction conflict, moral transformation bolters, bolsters our adherence to what is true good. In this discernment, we may discover our own potentialities as well as the potentialities of others. We may also determine, uncover, and expose the instances of breakdown in our society. We meet the challenge through development of long-term solutions, practical, intelligent decisions, and actions. Yet on communal and personal levels, Moral transformation is neither easy nor simple. <coughs> moral transformation is not moral perfection. Moral transformation is not moral perfection, but a risk into new and more fruitful living. The effort then to meet the demands of moral transformation brings the meaning of personal responsibility and authentic human living into sharp relief. Again, moral transformation is never so much an achievement as it is an ongoing commitment. <coughs> 
Solidaristic compassion <clears throat> is not a quick fix or momentary response to suffering and oppression. Social oppression assaults our connectedness to one another, materially but not formally. It assaults our connectedness to one another by establishing and structuring asymmetrical relations of injustice. But inasmuch as solidarity in this mode involves an attitude or disposition, it entails acknowledgement and acceptance of the humanity of the other as humanity, along with regard for the other in her and his own otherness. Thus, solidaristic compassion is rooted in the interconnectedness of our being human, rooted in our common creatureliness. For humanity is no mere collection of individuals. It's not an aggregate of autonomous and isolated monads, or beings out there. Humanity is intelligible reality. It's multiple, it's diverse, it's varied, and it's concrete, yet it is one. Whatever our creedal confessions, cultural heritages, historical backgrounds, political affiliations, social classes, racial constructions, gender or sexual orientations, we human beings all are intrinsically, metaphysically, and ineluctably connected. We are one. To be compassionate, to bear witness to solidaristic compassion then, entails a structure. Prophetic anger at the suffering and oppression of children, women, and men. Critical understanding of those injustices. A firm understanding or grasp, if you like, of our human and creaturely connectedness and interrelatedness to their suffering to them. Fourth, it includes the willingness to interpret contexts of injustice from the perspective of those who suffer. And fifth, it includes active commitment to create new relationships aimed to transform oppressive structures and realities and to open ourselves to gracious gifts of intimacy, friendship, and neighbor love. In Jesus of Nazareth, these possibilities of becoming, of being solidaristic compassion are made manifest in the flesh. He is the incarnation of God's compassion. <clears throat> Jesus, then, is the incarnation of God's compassion. The New Testament writers testify that when Jesus of Nazareth encountered suffering human beings, he responded with compassion. Through his whole being, his whole person, mind and heart, body and strength, Jesus sensed, grasped, understood, interpreted, valued, acted out, and embodied solidaristic compassion. These writers deploy the Greek verb splachnitsoi. I had a lesson just before this to make sure I got it right and I got it wrong, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, this Greek verb, splachnitsomai, uh, to convey, they use this verb to convey Jesus' convey Jesus's raw, <coughs> visceral response to human suffering. You know this verb derives from the noun splechnon, which means intestines, bowels, entrails. In other words, the writers intimate that when Jesus encounters infirmity, disease, hunger, loss, and lack, his gut reaction is to act and often very quickly. Through solidaristic compassion, Jesus demonstrates that infirmity, disease, hunger, disfigurement, spiritual or intellectual isolation and pain are significant. Awareness of the suffering of others aroused and focused his attention and moved him to compassion. I like to say he's got prophetic anger as well. It's a prophetic anger. <coughs> Jesus sees, hears, touches. He heals the child or woman or man who suffers of the affliction, and through that healing, Jesus heals the internal landscape of relationships in the village. 
Consider the sight of large crowds moved him to prophetic anger at the people's condition, their physical and spiritual hunger, their ostracism, their physical and spiritual suffering. Blind men cry out for a miracle. Moved by prophetic anger, Jesus touches their eyes and heals them. A leper begs for healing. Moved by prophetic anger, Jesus touches the man and heals him. Jesus sees a weeping mother. He is prompted to restore her son to him. Women and men who are rejected by family members or neighbors or religious authorities who subsist on fear. Jesus sees their pain and is aroused to prophetic anger and comforts them in solidaristic compassion. <clears throat> God in Jesus suffers with and <clears throat> suffers what poor, despised, excluded, abused children, women, and men undergo. God in Jesus leaps into our messiness, our panic and pain, into the meaninglessness of suffering and sustains our hope in the midst of our affliction. God in Jesus experiences what human creatures experience. Jesus acts out the love of divine compassion and solidarity. Ceaselessly responding to all who are suffering and in need, writes Gloria Schaub, God continually permeates the chaos of the cosmos in all its pain and suffering with divine energy drawing all to new life, close quote. <clears throat> Solidaristic compassion not only is a praxis of political theology, solidaristic compassion is the praxis of God. So solidaristic compassion and the praxis of political theology. Most fundamentally, solidaristic compassion is a condition of discipleship. It is bearing witness. As a theological category of social praxis, it concerns the empathetic incarnation of Christian love. It is an intentional, moral, and ethical task that begins in anamnesis, intentional remembering of the dead, exploited, despised, and powerless poor, and rises up to walk and to work in love. Solidaristic compassion calibrates the weight of the suffering earth and all its creatures to the justice of the God of Jesus. The deep ground of solidaristic compassion in political theology is the logos of the cross and resurrection with its indispensable narrative structure. It is complemented by the categories of memory, lament, and hope. At the same time, given that structure of compassion, political theology must possess a noetic praxis. So doing political theology within a global context would involve, among others, these tasks. <clears throat> Political theology directs prophetic anger at awakening us to the social suffering of God's human creatures. The violence and negations of everyday life are more than too much for us. We are left limp, dazed, unable to respond. Political theology pulls us out of our slumber and shocks us out of our complacency. Second. As an objective of a political theology, solidaristic compassion implies personal, interpersonal, and communal awareness, knowledge, intentionality, and action. Hence, it possesses this noetic praxis. Noetic praxis will entail rigorous critical dialectical discernment in weighing the values, complexity of social options to advance the good. At the same time, this will involve multiple transdisciplinary collaborations, collaborations with sociologists, with physicians, with psychologists, historians, economists, environmentalists, political scientists, 
educators as well as other theologians. Third, the protection and recovery of memory of the victims of history presents another task. On the one side, authentic solidarity resists the reduction and homogenization of the stories of the victims of history, the millions of despised, excluded, and poor. At the same time, all stories of all cultural and social groups are valuable because all lives are precious in the sight of God. Yet these stories must be told. They must be held and shared and examined and understood. If these stories are to offer <clears throat> any hope of forgiveness and reconciliation, these are the foundations of justice, then we must allow them to interrupt, amend, and resonate in the stories of others. Telling these stories challenges us to overcome the temptation to selective memory. Rather than erase memories, we confront the brokenness and hurt, the failures and joys that frighten us, as well as the wounds in which we too often take exquisite comfort. We must lance and cauterize these recollections, for infected memories feed, feed violence. Moreover, if we remember and tell our stories more inclusively, read all our stories against the grain of our own customs and mores, familial cultures and traditions, we will glimpse possibilities of hope, possibilities of reconciliation. <clears throat> On the other side, the susceptibility of our American society in particular to an intentionally induced cultural and historical amnesia, as well as our swift revision of events or persons, truly appalls. We need to retrieve the histories of the massive suffering endured on the Trail of Tears. In the Middle Passage, in the violation of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and so very much more. We need to recover and expose memories that have been too fearful and too ashamed, that we have been too fearful and too ashamed to admit and confront. We must take seriously the, <clears throat> uh, and I'm quoting here Metz, the negativity of history in its interruptive and catastrophic character, for these histories of suffering coalesce in a theological locus for truth-telling. These memories can never be a pietistic or romantic memorial. Intentional recovery and engagement of the histories of suffering is always fraught with ambiguity and with paradox. The victims of history are lost, but we are alive. Our recognition and regard for these victims, our shouldering responsibility for our complicity in their condition grounds the moral basis for solidaristic compassion <clears throat> as a Christian practice, as a Christian virtue, if you will. Fourth, solidaristic compassion is embodied ethics. <clears throat> embodied ethics is critically conscious of and challenged by the suffering of others and acts with and alongside them to resist that suffering, to liberate and heal the human spirit. Solidaristic compassion as embodied ethics is doing. It's doing. We place hearts and minds and bodies and strength, all from our knowing, at the service of a justice practice, Katie Cannon writes, for members of our species and the wider environment in which we are situated in order to resist conditions that thwart life arriving at new understandings of our doing, knowing, and being, close quote. Fifth, lament is a form of prayer and a practice of justice. To pray in lament is to pray in a spirit of resistance. Lament protests, pushes against that weight of power by which exploited, despised, and vulnerable children, women, and men suffer oppression and abuse. Lament not only dialogues, but also wrestles with God, questions, argues, and rebukes. 
In this way, lament takes seriously God's love and care in the midst of suffering and privation, even as it, <clears throat> excuse me, even as it refuses to accept a view of the world where God fixes everything, although God has not done so in the past. As a practice of justice, lament announces publicly what is unjust in the here and now. Lament grieves. <clears throat> the collapse of national and global relationships, it grieves and resists injustice, violence and terrorism. <clears throat> it grieves and resists injustice, the pernicious sexual abuse of children, the persistent exploitation and degradation of women, discrimination against gays and lesbians and transgender people, the warping of ministry and pastoral relationships. Lament grieves and names social pain when women and men are deprived of dignity, of adequate nourishment and shelter, of conditions for the flourishing of body and mind, heart and spirit. Lament constructs spaces of recognition and catharsis that prepare us for living justice and living solidaristic compassion. Prayers of lament summon us beyond ourselves and call us to be friends of God and prophets. These and other tasks for political theology are not ends in themselves, but rather aim to transform human history redeeming it through a knowledge born of subject-empowering, life-giving love and hope. And to that virtue we will turn in the third lecture. Thank you. so much for leading us deep into solidaristic compassion and practice. We have time for questions. I would ask that you wait until the mic is given to you and then please identify who you are. And, um, if you can share with your student family member or guest, that would also be helpful for us. Hi, my name is Stephanie. Uh, I'm a Stephanie? second yes, I'm a second year MDiv student, and my question is about prophetic anger. I feel like there have been times in the past where something along those lines has been used to justify the discrimination of people, and so how do we ensure that our prophetic anger is correctly guided? Yeah, I think that's a very uh, that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, it's not directed in a, in a way of hatred. It's directed at causes and conditions. And um, if you use that anger to, against persons, you're, you're, you're entering into the realm, really, of hatred or resentment. So we can be angry. I'm not trying to you know, have a little sidestep here that we, we're, ang we, we're angry at the thing but not the person. Because in fact we can be and probably ought to be angry at the person. But it doesn't need to turn into hatred of the person. We're talking this afternoon uh, about this in light of um, spoiling one's own spirit. That precisely what hatred does to us is it really turns us. It's a kind of, you could say, curdling almost. It's a kind of curdling. It's churning up something. And um, Jesus gets angry more than once. Uh, and and it's, he, that anger is waking up people. It's waking up people. It's not just the time at the temple. You know, we all, we're all agreed on that because he's throwing around tables. And so it's okay to be angry at tables. But I think he's angry at the condition. You know, as he's angry at the selling and buying and selling. Yes, he's very angry. Uh, at the reduction of, uh, of the temple, what should be something is not that any longer because you're manipulated it. Yeah. 
So, so I think, it, I think that's, a, that's a, a guiding edge on, on what we're angry about. Yes, and, and we, we use these words, love and hate, so loosely, we all do. Um, so it can make us a little more careful about what we say and when we say what we say. Is that useful? Okay. That's good. Hi, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Ross. I'm a first year MDiv. <clears throat> um, my question is about so I learned really when I got here what it means to be an ally. Mm -hmm. And um, my question, this is kind of stemming from a lecture that we got from Brian Massingale last week about ignorance. And I'm struggling to be how, and I'm, when I'm in majority white spaces, how do I combat ignorance mm -hmm. and from a way that is compassionate and loving um, in trying to like make allyship something that white populations take seriously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> did you ask Massingale this? I did. What did he say? <laughs> well, that's it. I mean, that is it, and, and recognize, I mean, this is, this is tough. This is real tough. You know, it's tough because you, you should stick with it. You must stick with it. If you, um, I, don't, I don't know your, you know, we're, we're, all, we're in an inter-religious situation very often, so I don't know, I don't know your, um, your religious background, but if you're a Christian, you must stick with it. You must. And uh, partly, I mean, there are any number of, um, of injunctions uh, in the New Testament, uh, many of which have been drawn from the Hebrew Bible, that talk about love of neighbor, love of one of the, the, those little statements I just read from Leviticus are not little, they're heavy. They're very heavy and they're very demanding for people in that context. So... There has to be a way that, that, you, that you stand up, but you can't expect a reward for standing up. You can't expect a reward. I'm not just saying this to you. I say this to myself periodically. Well, you're not getting a reward for doing the right thing. It's right. And that's the, that's the tough part. That's the tough part. Because by doing the right thing, you set yourself apart from those who are not doing the right thing. So you're, you're in a middle position, in a way, trying to figure out, I want to be an ally working at it. You have to stick with it. But it also, learns, it also means you take a step back in some situations. Because you have to learn from other people. The people who need you as an ally. And you have to take that task seriously. I mean, there's a noetic praxis. You have to learn. <laughs> that means you have to read. You have to apprentice yourself to learning something about those who you want to be in allyship with. Or you have to learn something about them. You can't expect them to teach you everything. And, and that's hard because it feels lonely. But uh, there is no... The only reward for doing the right thing is doing the right thing. That's the only reward. And it's, it is tough, but, but that's, that's what it is. So stick with it, you know. You know, whoever you're, you're in allyship with, you know, learn about them. I mean, you can go find books and read. We all read, you know. And you read a lot of different books. And the books aren't going to tell you everything because you need to meet and befriend and be with and enjoy people. That's the point. And eventually, you'll get to be friends with people. But, but the fact of the matter is, we all have to keep correcting our ignorance. We all have to. This is why people teach, so you can keep learning <laughs> in a formal way <laughs> and get paid for it. <laughs> it. 
seriously, I mean, it's, it's, uh, they're, they're, you have to want to do that. You want to do that. Good luck. Yeah, in a, in a real way, I mean, you know, truly, I don't mean that in a flip way, but I mean, stick with it. <coughs> stick with it. Thank you for your talk and for being so approachable. I can only imagine what you went through in your career to, to get where you are. And uh, very fast. Uh, how am I, well, your name. Oh, who I am. Uh, my name is Braulia. I'm third year I'm Div. I'm from Brazil. So um, that uh, should excuse me to get away with something <laughs> that I'm going to say now. <laughs> but, uh, so what I'm, I'm, not, I'm kind of frustrated with theology in a way. And these three years here, I, I came try, uh, thinking that I was going to find a vehicle through theology to discuss major injustice issues. What I found, it was like this fluid pull of evil that you actually cannot pinpoint, and, but you have to talk about it all the time. But you cannot express real concerns. For example, I, I was involved in Brazil with a, a fight against infanticide, which is a major problem happening in, in the tribes. But because it, is, it points to the, the, the oddity or to the, let's say, the, how the evil, I'm going to say it, the evil that uh, culture embodies, I cannot say it. I cannot discuss this theologically because in, there is no cultural evil in theology. There is racial evil, there is systemic evil, but I haven't heard any fingers pointed to, to actually and, and, you know, inherited cultural uh, understandings that are evil. I don't... I cannot talk about violence against women, for example, because gender is a, is a passé thing. And if we talk about women, uh, it's, we're going towards a genderless theology that acknowledges Imago Dei as being everything. I cannot talk about humans like, uh, for example, injustices uh, in Africa or going to, to, to fight against poverty. That's something that is doable today if we have a major effort. Uh, but I cannot talk about this in theology because we, we, we human beings are as important as animals and so I should fight for the whales and for the rats and for the uh, sea uh, lice as much as I fight for everybody else. So I, I see, I, my concern is theology is losing its edge. Well, so, that's, a, that, that is a, that's a good critique to be taken seriously. Uh, to find out whether or not that is the case or not. What I do think, um, and I say this uh, all the time, every culture, every culture, this is the Christian theologian, every culture comes under the critique of the gospel. Every culture. It doesn't matter who it is, where it is, what it is. It comes under the critique of the gospel. Now, we can talk about enculturation, but there will always be some things that the gospel cannot admit. There can always be some things that the gospel cannot admit. I really, uh, I personally, uh, well, I mean, I don't need to, well, I need to be that personal, but I, I think, um, I mean, I can, I can, I understand, I'm beginning to understand truly what's happening uh, in terms of ecology. This is about the life of the planet. This is about the species. But, but I spend my intellectual interests on human beings. And I do that because I've found we have become very calloused toward human beings. This is part of the issue of um, what we think about serial killers who just dispose of women at will. This is, uh, we, and everything is conspiring to make us forget these egregious sorts of things. I mean, maybe we have a terrible problem in the state of Massachusetts, at least it's in, in the greater Boston area, of people running down people in cars, sort of hit and run, you know? And they, they just drive away. And so someone's dead, you know? And they don't stop, they don't... But we're the same people who are rescuing, you know, the whales when they beach, or we're all running out there to Cape Cod. So I, I, have, a, I have a little bit of a distance you know, in whatever the creation story says, 
it doesn't get translated that all things are made in God's image and likeness. Only the earth creatures are made in God's image and likeness. God takes up the earth. And, but our, we have a responsibility to all those creatures, responsibility to the earth. A few, I'll just make this last comment because I don't want to go on. Somebody else has a question. But a few days ago, um, in this little, we were talking about this today at lunch, in this little publication, um, I'm sure it circulates to people who are more than Catholics, but Catholics are reading a lot, this a lot. It's called Give Us This Day. And a few weeks ago, we remembered Sister Dorothy Stang, who was a nun who was killed in the rainforest because she was helping people who were trying to protect the rainforest for their livelihood. Very isolated groups of people. And two people come out of a forest and kill her, shoot her dead. She's from Dayton, Ohio, you know. And they do this, and um, why? Because of a support for other people who are supporting the earth. And there's an interconnection. That's the other thing. We're all made out of the same stuff. That's the other thing. That's the other thing. Hi, thank you. My name is um, Alexia Williams. I'm a PhD student in American Studies and African American Studies. Um, and the question I want to ask is if you could elaborate on what accountability uh, looks like under solidaric, solidaristic compassion. Um, and when you were speaking about love and forgiveness, I was reminded of the people who were killed by Dylan Roof while they were worshiping. Mm -hmm. And the next day in the press, they were saying immediately, we forgive him. And, and you know, I'm, I'm just wondering what type of framework of accountability um, can, can we get? Yeah. Thank you. Um, that is, that's very important. That's very important. I think two things. Um, first of all, the people who had the loss of life there, who lost their grandmother, their spouse, their sister, whoever, their brother, those people can forgive. The nation cannot forgive. It's not our responsibility to forgive, those, to give this, forgive this man. He committed a crime for which he must answer. But they were operating on a very deep religious level, on a level out of their religious experience and their religious living. So we can't presume that we have that depth as a nation. We can't presume that we have that depth. Across religions, we can't presume that we have that depth as a nation. What I do think, um, and this, this is not quite a, a real answer to your question because it's, it's a really good point um, in terms of developing issues of accountability. But um, let me say this, that the question of the ally is also at stake here. So no one in this room or within the hearing the sound of my voice, okay. No one is responsible for what happened 400 years ago in 1619 when those people were brought here by the Dutch into New York. Nobody is responsible for that. If you feel guilty, you shouldn't. What you should feel guilty about is your behavior now. If you are replicating that from then, if you are replicating those attitudes, that behavior, yes, that's, your, that's what you're accountable for. That's what you're accountable for. It has to stop somewhere, and someone has to take responsibility for it. Not the people who came here, brought here in chains, but somebody has to take responsibility so that there is a change. So it has to stop in some way. It must stop. So it, forget the guilt about what happened. And it is 400 years, and it's shocking to think of that. I'm just struggling with this. But I'll add, I have this recognition. I've just been struggling with it. Just struggling with it. 400 years, and you can't get a bank loan. I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about average, average people. 
think of how long <laughs> the lives of indigenous people have been disrupted. Think of how when uh, the federal government wanted to buy Mexican land and the Mexicans didn't want to sell their land, we just took it. Just went to war and took it. Then had a treaty that said we wouldn't do it again and that you could be citizens and then we just tore up the treaty. So you're not responsible for that, but you're responsible for your behavior now, which requires education. That's your point about ignorance. And this is your point about accountability. Yeah. Fred, 